Good morning and Happy New Year. A few uh, announcements. Uh, join us for Sunday School next week. We'll be talking about the exile of Judah and the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, this morning was a great lesson on the prophet Jeremiah and his uh, prophecies or the Lord's prophecies concerning the, the um, destruction of his people. Uh, come this evening at 6 p.m., we're going to resume our evening worship service. Uh, I, there's a, it's a question and answer session with Dr. Robert Godfrey, Burke Parsons, and Derek Thomas, and I took all the questions and lined them up and printed them in the announcements this morning so you can read through and see the questions that they're going to be asked in the um, session we'll watch this evening. Join us this Wednesday evening. We're going to have a uh, undecoration of the church. Um, we're going to take down the tree, put away the ornaments and all the uh, decorations, and we are going to be uh, eating pizza afterwards. So join us for fellowship and pizza on Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Uh, there's a, a ministry opportunity. A few individuals have expressed a desire to minister in local nursing homes. So if you desire to join their efforts, please speak to one of the elders and we'll give you more details. And our missions uh, focus this week um, is a praise to God. Uh, our faith promise giving uh, came in a little bit more than what we pledged to give for 2022. So we are thankful to the Lord for that and, and to you. And uh, we were able to give our missionaries a year-end gift uh, before the end of the year just to help with relieving the expenses from inflation and this kind of thing. So thank you for that. And um, if you haven't already, please uh, pledge your faith promise for 2023. Clark and I are going to meet this week to have a budget meeting and, and determine all that um, for the new year. That turned over to Greg. Greg and I both stayed up very late last <laughs> night. <Yeah. laughs> no. Good morning. Good morning. Well, God has given us a new year and a new year to bring the message of Christ to the world. If you'll take your bulletins and you can follow along in our call to worship and then the congregational response. So I would ask us, let's rise for the call to worship and we can follow along and respond. From Psalms. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Who has remembered us in our lowly state and rescued us from our enemies. O oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come rejoicing because of those true words, Lord. We know that your mercy endures forever. We thank you that you have sent Christ into the world to redeem us. Lord, thank you that you have given us strength and power to serve you, even in this year that's coming. Lord, as we come singing your praise, Lord, grant us your presence and grace and mercy in this year as we bear your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, pick up our hymns, hymnals for uh, 528, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart, 528. <coughs>
Affirmation of Faith is on page 851, <clears throat> the Apostles' Creed. We always retrace the truth that God has given us in his scripture. Page 851, so I ask Christian, what has God told us in his word we must believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is in Joshua 14, verse 6 and onward. We'll turn to Joshua 14. Now this is the recording of the conquest of Canaan by Israel when they finally come out of the wilderness and begin to conquer. At this point, of course, Moses has died and Joshua is leading them. But about 40 years before this, a good old fellow named Caleb. Uh, Caleb was ready to enter the land and to conquer with faith, but Everyone else in Israel had a lack of faith and they didn't enter in to conquer the land. So Caleb now, 45 years of waiting to get this prize that was in front of him. So now Joshua 14, they're, they're entering the land, they're conquering. Caleb is um, 85 years old and he asks God, basically saying, remember me, Lord. Remember this prize, give me this mountain to conquer. This points to our sermon in Ephesians. So Joshua 14, verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you 
and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren, who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now in my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Amen. Let's bow our hearts and minds before the Lord in a time of silent confession of sin. Amen. <clears throat> Oftentimes I'm told by folks that they don't pray because they don't feel good enough to pray. And I automatically know that's not the reason. The reason is they're not reading their Bible. <laughs> One of the simple assurances of pardon come to us from Psalm 103. I'll just read a few verses there. The Lord, this is, well, by the way, of David. Everybody thinks that he was a super righteous guy. He was not. He was chosen by the Lord. Read about David and you'll see that he was a sinner, just like you and I. <clears throat> the Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does, this, does he remove our transgressions from us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and please don't be afraid to pray. If 
Father, we have confessed that we have all fallen far short of your glory. And yet in your infinite mercy, Father, you have placed on us the righteous robe of your Son who had no sin. And you have chose to look upon us and see his righteousness. You are indeed a merciful God. Father, you have also given us a command that we should in fact pray for one another. And so we do. Father, throughout the scriptures we read about the the idols of people. Even your own people fell into that. Father, we look at that and we often laugh and we don't have our eyes open to our own idols. Father, we have but to look around us and see where people put their devotions. Large fancy cars, large fancy homes. Working father, late hours at the expense of their families. Father, we are those who need your forgiveness and we need to open our eyes to to your mercy. For you have been you have been good to us. And looking at us, you see that perfect righteousness of Christ. Father, within our own congregation here, there are hardships, not from our own doing, Father, but oftentimes the frailty of our old age creeps up on us. For many of us, Father, that's here. We're very grateful, Father, for, for medicines and vitamins and all those things which help for the good wisdom you've given doctors to help us. But Father, we also know there are some here who are suffering from most difficult things in their hearts. They suffer day to day, Father, from rejection of their families. Or Father, so often, Children seems to be, seem to have gone their own ways and forgotten about the parents who raised them. Father, there are many of us who still are going through difficult times, having to balance work with home, struggling, Father, with the demands of work, whether they're of you or whether they need to step away and do something else. And often, Father, you know that that is so hard to do. For we fear, Father, will you indeed take care of us? Father, there are children. They come to Sunday school or they come to their parents and their parents teach them things which are right and wrong. And they go and turn around, Father, and go outside. And the world tells them just the opposite. Father, we are all needy. We are all needy in our heart, our minds, our bodies. We are frail. And we look forward, Father, to the work of your spirit in our heart, strengthen us. Father, we look 
this morning in Sunday school at Jeremiah. He was given a task, Father, which I hope many of us don't have to bear. And yet, Father, saying that, I know there are some who have a similar task, who feel rejected, and we ask, Father, for you to bless, to strengthen, make your presence real, make us strong. Though we mourn, Father, we pray that the, the perfect righteousness of Christ, which we will have, will be pleasing, will relieve our sins. Father, I don't pretend to understand how you're going to make me forget all my sins in glory. But I trust you for that. That those who know you and love you will come together in wonder and worship and service for you. Father, I could ramble here a long time, but I won't. Father, we'll close this portion with our Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. To continue in worship, we look to hymn number 429. Let's take our hymn, those 429, let's stand and sing. Come down, Fount. we begin this new year, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. We, we missed or skipped over this passage last year. When we look back at last year, I think if you're like any of us, you're probably saying, well, some battles I won, some battles I lost. 
Uh, there's some battles that I, I want to remember, but quite frankly, there's some battles I want to forget. It's honest. And uh, one thing is sure, we are, we're still in the battle, in the fight, so the battle of 2023 is about to begin. And here, Paul in Ephesians 6, he's sort of telling them uh, to give a spiritual weapons check to fellow soldiers in Christ to make sure we're properly dressed for the battle that is absolutely, surely coming ahead of us. So Ephesians 6 verse 10, God's call to arms. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Let's ask God's help in hearing his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us without the weapons of war. Oh God, help us to wield them rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. He gives the command, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, sort of dot, 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 he says, to this end. Verse 18, what is the end to which we are to be strong? He says, being watchful for all of the saints with all perseverance and prayer for each other. So he's giving this collective collateral call for each of us to serve one another in Christ by using these weapons of the war. The weapons are not just offensive, they are defensive. So he gives this weapons check for these kind of six battlefields that he's listing that we're going to fight on every one of this year. So kind of in reverse order, six battlefields. Now he speaks, obviously, at the cosmic level of war. He says, with all the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, and clearly he's speaking about invisible things and things we cannot see, things that we have no ability to know that's in front of us. Number five, he speaks of warfare at sort of a national level. He's really getting at things that are visible, that things that visibly can be seen. There's evil behind it, but we can see its power. We can see its principalities and those that rule, he says, the darkness of this age. Then fourth, he speaks of the war sort of at a local level. He speaks of the walk and the talk that each of us have when we're speaking about Christ. And Paul says down here at the end, he says, basically, just like me, I'm going to need help to be able to speak these words rightly. And then third, he speaks of the battlefield inside of the church itself. Verse 18, he speaks of collectively, collectively being uh, persevering with prayer for each other and using these weapons so that, number two, if this is being done inside of the church, 
uh, by extension, God's covenant family inside of our own households become covered with this armor of God if the church is practicing it rightly. But it, it gets down to that number one battlefield uh, that has to be found, fitted with all of these weapons to be used in the right way for the right battles. He's speaking of the battlefield inside of each person's heart. That's where the battlefield really is, the number one battlefield. The battlefield of the human heart where really all of these weapons that we're going to use, they have to be uh, waging war against us initially. First, they come against us. So in the end, the, the battlefield of the human heart, if there is no conquest by these weapons in my heart, then no other victory in my life on any battlefield is going to follow. They have to begin in the heart. If, if God is not having victory in my own heart, how will I ever win other battles for Jesus Christ? Now, we have good days and we have bad days. We have our highs and we have our lows, but what Paul's getting at is that if we don't remain utterly dressed for a battle at all times, you look ahead into this year and you can bet that you're going to become a casualty of the war instead of these conquerors in Christ that God has made us to be with all of the weapons that he has given us to fight with. You want to be a conqueror or do you want to conquer in Christ? Verse 12, Paul began sort of pulling back this veil and he starts uncovering all of these uh, things that are invisible. He's exposing what you and I might call in the modern political day, we like to call it the deep state. The deep state inside of the government. Something's working inside of it. Uh, sort of the spiritual deep state that he talks about that's doing things behind the scenes. He pulls the covers off. In verse 12, he says, you do understand we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not simply flesh and blood. It's better to say, really, he's saying that we're not just dealing with flesh and blood. We're not just fighting against the neighbor next door that we see. We're not just fighting against the power we see wrongfully being wielded inside of governments and around us. Uh, that is sort of a visible footprint. There is a visible footprint of that stuff. Um, have you ever watched J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, movies or you, you read anything in any of his books? I love his little statement. He says he calls this stuff behind the scenes. He calls it the older and the fouler things that are hidden inside of the deep places of the earth. We see its footprint. Now, this passage, he's using the plural voice. We tend to pick this passage up and we want to read this immediately back onto ourself. We shouldn't do that because it, it changes the meaning. He is speaking here to the whole body of Christ as a whole. He's speaking for us to be collectively dressed, all of us gathering together and then collectively being dressed with these collective weapons and these collective armors. He's not just getting at the individual here, but he wants us to see the whole church that is dressed as though it was one single soldier being fitted with all of these weapons for the battle. Verse 11, I know it's probably some kind of southern Greek because he says, y'all, you all. Verse 11, you all put on the weapons and the armor of Christ. Collectively, he means as one man, the church as a whole. Now, verse 11, he uses a word here. You flip the language open, and he calls these weapons, he calls them um, panoply. There we go. Panoply. In the, in the language, it's uh, panopoloin. But the word panoply is underneath. Pan, meaning all or everything. And so in English, it says the whole armor, but there's some juice in this word underneath, this panoply. He's getting at all of the total weapons together, working as though they were one single weapon. So there's one single soldier, and really there's one single weapon, not just individual weapons, but they're all working at one time. So he's communicating to us that the, tum, sum, the, uh, the total sum of all of the weapons we've been given, the total amount of those is greater than any value of one single part. Not just individual pieces, but the sum total. And you can do the obvious math. You can imagine a, a soldier that's standing in the middle of a battlefield and he has nothing on his head but a helmet. No clothes, no weapons, just, just a helmet. It's good that you have the, the helmet of salvation 
But if you don't have a sword in your hand, you're not going to last for a day on the battlefield. That is what Paul's saying makes you strong in the Lord. That's where you get this command from. Be strong in the Lord. He's not talking about someone that walks around sort of puffed up or not someone that can just stand and speak truth necessarily, but the church being strong in the Lord by picking up the pieces of the armor as a whole, not just as individuals, but the body of Christ as a whole. So he's speaking this to sort of rouse the church up as though it was a garrison, getting it ready in singularity for the year and the life that is to come. Now, the weapons that he's speaking of, when it, is, when it is assembled, when the armor is assembled, this is the way through which God's power is mediated. We don't mean the weapon itself has power. We don't mean that we ourselves are mediating power. But when the weapons are assembled, uh, God's power is mediated through the church. It's mediated through the members and through the use of these weapons that communicate this power. Um, so uh, the warfare means this. The weapons don't fire themselves. No gun ever killed anyone. No sword ever slew anyone. No arrow ever killed anyone. They have to be picked up. They have to be used. Swords have to be wielded. The shields have to be raised. So the weapons he's speaking of have to be picked up and they have to be put on and they have to be used in light of specific battles that God brings us into. And he's communicating that it is the privilege and the sake of advancing the kingdom of God. That's why you've been given the weapons. Do we understand why we have been given weapons? Do we understand why we've been fitted with weapons? In reality, it's not for our safety. We may die in battle. The weapons of the warfare are not just for our safety. It's really for the safety, for the sake of the gospel being carried into the unspeakable darkness that is around us. That's why you've been given the weapons. They are to protect you as you advance the kingdom of Christ and speak the truth. Now, some battles you get to choose. You can choose someone to go interact with. There are other days in which the enemy has targeted you. You wind up with egg on your face, and sometimes, if we're honest, we become the battle ourselves. We end up being the problem. We can say, again, we know the battle belongs to the Lord. We know that the victory belongs to the Lord, but he's driving at it that the weapons have to be picked up and used or you and I are going to live a defeated Christian life in the next year. Do you want victory or will you choose defeat? Paul lists your weapons. Verse 14 and on. These are your weapons. He begins with truth. That's your weapon, offensively and defensively. He gives you truth. He then gives you righteousness, both the righteousness of Christ, but also the righteousness you practice. He gives you the gospel of peace. Then he says you have been given faith. You have begun uh, salvation, which can be also translated as deliverance. And then he says you've been given the sword of the spirit, which is God's word, and then prayer. Now, this is seven weapons. So the giving of seven weapons, it's to signify its completeness. He's telling us there are no other weapons. What are you waiting for? There's, there's no other weapons that God's going to give. There's, there's no, he's not holding out. It's not under a chair somewhere. There's no other weapons. There's no new weapons he's going to give. There's no plan B. You are the plan. You are the plan with the weapons. God has given. There's not a plan B for advancing the kingdom. You're the plan with the weapons shielded with that power. Now, verse 19, this is why when Paul takes all the weapons and dumps them on the table and passes them out around the room, he turns around and says, I need these weapons. A, an apostle of God, well, he's an apostle. D does he really need all of this? Isn't he special? Verse 19, Paul shakes his head and he says, no. Verse 19, he says, and for me, he means pray for the apostle." He says, and for me, that utterance, words, 
will be given to me, pray for my weak use of God's world. An apostle of God needing prayer because of his weak use of God's word, he says, that I may open my mouth boldly. He's tasting fear. To make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in chains, he's literally chained, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. God help me that I'm not a coward in the battle, that I'm not found hiding your word in this truth that you've given me. Read what he's praying. This apostle is praying that he will not be found a coward in battle. It's okay to pray that way. We need it. Now, the same weapons that God gave you last year, these are the same weapons he's going to give you this year. That's it. You can count the battles. See what you did. See what you didn't do. Paul, Paul understood this. He understood what it meant to be knocked down and to have to cry out for help in order to be made strong. And frankly, it's good sometimes that we get knocked down so that we begin to learn how to wield the weapons we've been given. He's just a little scared about the battles that are coming because some of them he can see. Now, verse 11, he then uses another word. Verse 11 in English, it says, we read it, it says, to put it on, but there's some juice under this word. Um, it's the word underneath is analabete, I think it's analabete, which literally means take up arms, not just put on something. It says to take up arms or to lift them up or to rise up and to go fight. And he's getting at the point that it's better to have offense than to just be stuck in your defense. He's saying the best defense is a good offense. And it's a military term. It's got a lot of little military terms here. But he's saying to someone that's a soldier sort of like this, that only a foolish man is going to wait until he is attacked before he begins to put on the armor. Only a foolish soldier waits to put on the armor. How many arrows is it going to take before I start praying? How many times am I going to have to fail before I begin to raise up the shield, before I begin to cry out to God and to assemble these weapons together? You know, um, think of this. Think of this as God giving you a concealed carry permit. Okay? Better, you think of this as better, this is really more like God's visible carry command. He's giving you a visible carry command uh, as a sort of a weapons check for the Christian who understands the darkness of the world that we're in. Silence is a, brings abuse and all the complaining doesn't replace the gospel of Christ that we have to speak of. Now, I'm always amused whenever I come to a building and I see a little sign that's hung on the door that says no guns allowed. You see little signs that say gun free zones because clearly the devil's going to look at that and go, <clears throat> darn, that's it. that's it. I can't go in that place. It's going to stop evil from coming inside the building. It should say every single solitary gun is allowed. You'd be amazed how much violence that would stop. Man, your enemy has concealed carry. Your enemy has concealed carry. He says the invisible powers you can't see. Now, you better be packing some heat spiritually wherever you're going with this truth. You're going to have to be watchful in Christ to that end. Again, Paul's point, all of the weapons needed collectively to wage war effectually. Now consider faith. He speaks of faith. Faith and he speaks of truth. But if you have faith and you don't have truth, what do you have? You have a train wreck. You have people that claim all faith but can't pay the water bill. You have this idea of faith without truth that is a wrecking ball. It, it's blind and it's reckless. You want to see faith? Look at the Muslims. How does your faith stack up against the faith of a Muslim? They got faith, man. They've got faith. They've got radical zeal. They just have a false god. They, they have a radical faith, but it's missing the truth that comes from God. They don't have truth. They have faith. And when you hear someone say these words over and over, well, God told me this. God said this to me. Uh, God told me this. The little phrase, God told me this, is not a substitute for the truth of the Bible says. That's the point. You've got to have truth with faith. Faith has to be joined with God's truth, or, or the battle's going to belong to the flesh or to the devil. 
Now, likewise, the, the sword of the Spirit. Well, isn't that good by itself? The sword of the Spirit, God's Word, God's Word or God's sword of the Word, it has to be wielded by the Holy Spirit. We present the Word, but we don't really wield the Holy Spirit, right? We don't wield the Holy Spirit in battle. We present truth. We present God's scripture. Um, the Holy Spirit wields uh, uh, the word that is being presented. The sword of God's word must be taken into the battle. But you do bring the word of God. But if you don't ever bring the word of God, there's no way to explain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. You have to have the word of God. But if the sword that you have is never taken into battle, it's sort of like a sword that's hung on a wall. It becomes more of a piece of artwork. It can never reveal Jesus Christ. It actually becomes useless if it's not brought into battle. Now, this is sort of, sort of like spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are different. But it's like spiritual gifts. We know the Holy Spirit gives the church for edification. It gives spiritual gifts to some people. All people have some gifts. He'll give things like preaching. He gives the gift of teaching, the ministry of helps, service. He, there's deacons and there's elders and so on. Each of these gifts, they're given in the same way. They're distributed inside of the body, but they have to come together as one in order to complete the man of God so that no one person, no one man, the church is not complete with any one single gift. It needs them all. However, there's a difference. Unlike spiritual gifts, which cannot be obtained from God if he didn't give it to you. They're specific. Some of them are very specific spiritual gifts. They are attached even to things like gender. Some spiritual gifts are attached to gender. There's gender roles inside of the church, inside of the family. There's a family head of the house, uh, deacons and elders. The Bible is clear. Those spiritual gifts are given to men and the head of the household. But the weapons of God are not this way. The weapons of God are not constrained to any individual. The, the panoply of God's armor is given universally to everyone across the board. It's given to little children. Every last man, woman, and child inside of the church has equal access to the armor of God, to the weapons of God, to the power of God, and the ministry of God completely. So the only question comes down to who is willing to pick it up and put it on? It means that a small child can be greater in spiritual battle than the parent who fails to pray. Little children from the mouth of babes, more powerful in battle than even seasoned men. Now we know one young boy that understood this. A little boy named, named David understood this. David understood this, being the least in his father's house. David understood this. Instead of a cowardly king Saul, he understood that. David understood it. And in the end, it's not a slingshot and a stone that kills Goliath at all. It's a little boy with no status and no position, but he understood he could stand in the power of his God. That's the battle. Verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the day that is evil and having done all to stand. Now, uh, David understood this. Right? David understood that he was standing in front of something. It was spiritual darkness that was being manifested through a real man. Satan works through real men. God works through real men. And Goliath was simply a, a minion of Satan. But, you know, David must have been snickering under his breath. Because he's looking at Goliath and he's thinking, boy, you're naked on the battlefield. You got nothing. Absolutely nothing. He, he was naked. Now, David stood on truth. And that's where he could stand. Verse 14, this is why Paul begins. Why does he begin this way? Why does he begin with truth? I mean, there's salvation down there. There's faith down there. Why does he begin with truth? This offensive and defensive weapon of truth. Verse 14, stand therefore girding your waist with truth. Well, there's kind of an obvious answer to this. Quite simply, if you already have the truth, 
You don't have to go anywhere else. If you're already standing on the truth, you don't have anywhere else to run, nowhere else to hide. You have to stand. It's defensive first. You have to present truth. You've taken a stand. X marks that spot. Uh, so the challenge is for you to keep standing in the truth, regardless of what comes in this next year. When it says verse 13, he says that you may be able to stand. This is also another, I love this. It's another little military term. That you may be able to stand um, underneath. Um, oh my gosh, let's see. Military term. Um, for, here it is. You accept the challenge. If you look up this word, you can see how it's described. When you make a stand, you're accepting the challenge on the ground that you took. You've accepted the challenge to be attacked where you stand. So on a battlefield, you, you figure out where you're going to attack and where you're going to stand. And so Paul says this because we already have the high ground. We already have the high ground of truth in the scripture. When you take the high ground with truth in Christ, you are eliciting the attack of the evil one simply by not being moved. So the point of this passage comes down to this. God is telling us that we have an impossible task. If you don't think it is, don't go into battle. We've been given an impossible task that requires an impossible strength to endure impossible odds and to win. You win here, now, not just in the end. That's his point. God has not given you defunct weapons. There's winning now. Uh, not, you don't just survive in some rough and tumble world just being bruised and battered. He's given you this to win with the weapons that God has given you now. Battles are going to be different for every one of us. It's going to be different uh, in each season, in each person, in each year, in each life. But God's point is you have not just been given the power to survive. You've been given the power and the ability to win spiritually in Christ right now. That's a point. You can win in your heart. You can see sanctification in your heart. It's just a matter of whether or not you're going to pray and fast and pick up God's word. You want to see winning in your heart? There's the tool. You can win in your family with righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that you've been given, the righteousness that you're going to practice in front of your family. You went into church with theology and preaching, and in your job, you know what it might look like for you to win in battle spiritually at your job? You might get fired for standing on the truth. That's victory in Jesus. Now Luke 14, Jesus looked at his disciples and he told them this in Luke 14. He says, yes, there is a cost of being my disciple and there's also a cost for winning. Get it in your mind that you're going to win. He says, the cost is coming after me daily, taking up a cross daily. Luke 14, 31, Jesus tells them, do you understand that the weapons that I have given you and the commands I have given you, they are joined together. My weapons are equal to the commands they will accomplish the task. So he's not talking about a prosperity gospel here. He ain't talking about money and power and fame, but he is talking about a prosperity gospel. It is a prosperity gospel of servanthood and suffering uh, to advance the kingdom of God through us. Now, lastly, beware when a pastor says that. Lastly, a soldier is known by the weapons that he uses in battle. Different armies use different weapons. They're known by the weapons that they use because those weapons, they reveal which kingdom or which side is trying to take advantage on the battlefield. Now, around the year 400 A.D., 400 A.D., suddenly there was this brand new weapon that started beginning to appear on the battlefield in Europe, and it was a little short axe, a little short-handled axe uh, with a metal head on it, and it was called the Francesca, the Francesca or the Francesca axe, and this is how it was used. When your troops lined up and you charged these other troops, as you ran at them maybe 10 or 15 feet away from them, you'd pull out this axe and you would throw it at them and it would catch them off guard as you then contacted the enemy. And it was used by the people called the Franks. The Franks. 
use this weapon. And the Franks began to be associated with this weapon, and they called it the Frankish Axe, or the Francescan, or the Francesca. It becomes known as the French Axe, the Francesca. So it begins to be identified with the kingdom that uses it. So the French and the Francesca and the Axe, the, the name all gets blurred together. So you understood if you're being attacked by a group of men with axes, it's the Franks, it's the French with the Francescan Axe. So it means the name of the weapon and you have become associated. This is why you are called a Christian. This is where you get your name from. You get your name from the mightiest weapon of God in battle. You get your name as a Christian. We bear the name of God's weapon of war. We're identified with that name because we're using the weapons he gives. We're identified by the weapons that we use in battle. It's good to ask this. What are the weapons I am known for dealing with the battles in my life? It'll show you which kingdom is being advanced. Now we'll close in just a moment. I think we forget sometimes this is not my war. It is God's war. This is God's war. And we've been brought into this war. It's a war that Revelation tells us Chapter 12 of Revelation tells us that this war broke out in heaven. Revelation 12, 7, it says it. The war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, they fought against Lucifer and his angels. Verse 8, no place was found for Lucifer and his angels in heaven anymore. Verse 9, it gets dicey. They were cast out, it says, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world, they were cast out and they were thrown down to earth with the angels. Your enemy is here. You and I in Adam, we brought the war here. We brought the war here by following Satan's rebellion. Satan is cast down here. We rebel. We're all stuck in the same place where the war continues to rage on. Luke 10 Luke 10, 18, Jesus describes this in one little phrase. Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. He's meaning two ways. One, Jesus' defeat of him now, but also the bigger sense of which Satan is cast out from heaven. And then he turns around to the disciples and he says, fear not. Guess what? Verse 19 in Luke 10, 19, he says, I have given you authority. I've given you authority to trample over serpents and scorpions. I've given you power and authority over all of the power of the enemy. Nothing shall ever hurt you or harm you if you're picking up and using the weapons. Luke 10, he, he tells this to the disciples. You see the disciples run out into the streets and they start having amazing success. And they turn around and come back to Jesus and they're excited. That, Lord, Lord, even the demons are, are responding to us now because of your name. Uh, they respond to us. And Jesus turns the disciples around and gets their heads right. He reminds them that the point of the power that's been given in his name is not simply that he has given them power over Satan. You do know that. You have power greater than him in Christ and in the weapons. He says, but instead of that, rejoice in this. Because if you're able to pick these weapons up and put these weapons on, it means one thing. Your name is written down in the book of life in heaven. Are you wielding the weapons? It's the evidence of our name written in heaven. And I honestly will close with this short story. Good old General George Patton. Mm. General George Patton in World War II, he had an attitude issue. Patton had an attitude, but when he was trying to rally his troops to battle, to fight against the German troops, Patton was, uh, Patton was known for some of his many quotes. And you've heard this quote. He made this quote up, and it was, it was sort of coined by him. He said, quote, lead me or follow me or get out of my way. Either lead me in battle 
or follow me into battle or get out of my way. That sort of summed up his overly colorful life and language. But he was a man bred just for war. And then one day Patton is looking at his soldiers trying to get them ready. And he says to his soldiers, he said, you've heard it said that a, a soldier must lay down his life in battle for his country. You must lay down your life in battle for your country in war. You must lay down your life in war to win. He says, that's nonsense. He says, no soldier, no soldier ever won a war by laying down his life for his country. A soldier wins by making the other guy and the enemy soldier lay down his life for his country. It's, it's, it's real. Dying in battle doesn't give us victory if the enemy has not been killed off already, if it's not being won already. To die in battle means nothing if there's no victory in it. Now, Patton was right and wrong, but honestly, this is what Jesus Christ understood as we get ready to come to the table. Christ understood this. The Christ that we have understood this by laying down his own life first, dying first, killing off all of his and our enemies first, killing off our sins first, and then giving us power in the Holy Spirit. The honest thing that Jesus said, no, no greater love does any man have than to lay down his life for his friends. That's genuine love, but his love was laid down for a point. It was to raise us back up to be spiritually resurrected now. We do know the first spiritual resurrection is now. It's right now in Jesus Christ in our hearts. We are spiritually resurrected now with new power, now in Christ and then set loose in the battle to claim the prize for Jesus Christ. So as we look into this year that's coming, you better be gathering your weapons. But it's okay. If you'd be like good old Caleb, good old Caleb we read about earlier, in the book of Joshua, he understood the faithfulness of God for anyone who is ready, willing, and able to stand up, put on the whole armor of God, to look ahead and say, Lord, give me this mountain for your glory. Let this be our cry as we go into this new year. Let's bow. Oh God, thank you that you did not leave us naked on the battlefield. Lord, we thank you for Christ and his full victory. Lord, convince us in our spirit. Lord, help our hands, even in the weak use of your tools. We know, Lord, your power has been given to us. Lord, grant us the success for your kingdom this year. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare for the table, we'll sing the first three stanzas of 243, How Firm a Foundation. Let's rise to sing verse 1 through 3. How firm a foundation. Did I get it wrong? Oh, uh, I got the church's name wrong. So what is the number? How firm a foundation. I think it's 243. Can anyone help me? Uh, the weapons are gathering together. Okay. I'm being strengthened. That's my bad. That's my bad. Well, yeah. 233. Yes. I got four, four of the church's names wrong. Yes. <laughs> it's close. Right. Someone is behind the scenes is working here. There we go.
seated. We know of this table that's in front of us. We know this table is the testimony that Christ has won for us all of the battles uh, of righteousness on our behalf. Um, this table is for those who have received the atonement of Jesus Christ because we've trusted in the victory of Jesus Christ. For those who have been baptized into a church and baptized into the death and re resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith. It's for those who are trusting that Jesus has substituted himself for us on the cross. This table is for the members of any good church and good standing and evangelical church, those who are at peace with all members and the church of God. But even so, this is a call to repentance. Even going inside this new year, Communion is a call to repentance, and even in the moment right now, if your heart is able to find repentance, confession and repentance, then we can eat and drink of this. But if there is not yet repentance in the heart at this hour, we must refrain from partaking of this meal until there's repentance. Because as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are looking for the second coming of Christ to judge the world. In the Lord's word, on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, giving it to the disciples, saying, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Take Eat this bread, it is given to you in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you.
Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the meal that we have had. We ask forgiveness for any imperfections in our hearts and minds. And we trust this to Jesus as well. Lord, we look to your strength and we trust it in this year in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last three verses, four through six. How firm a foundation. from his word now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and abounding in his grace we give thanks in Jesus name amen